Hey everybody, happy to be back with you, Jersey First TV. And tonight I am so pleased to have this excellent guest. We're so proud of him in New Jersey, Senator Michael Testa. Senator, welcome to Jersey First TV. It's great to be on Jersey First TV. This is our first meeting and it's a pleasure to meet you, Elizabeth. Well, of course, we all know you so well. You have been an advocate and fighting for all of us in New Jersey. I, only since 2019, I feel like you've been doing this forever. Your name is everywhere. We see you showing up whenever people need help and we appreciate that. But tonight we want to really bring people up to speed on what you're doing to fight for us in Trenton. I know you just came back from Trenton. You're on your way to another event. So we appreciate your time. But just so everybody knows, in case they don't, uh, not only are you a sitting state senator, you are also a lawyer and you've, you've got a history of public service, which we appreciate so much about you. And not only that, but President Trump identified you early on in uh, your Senate career to help him co-chair his uh, his candidacy and his campaign in New Jersey. So, Senator, let's start with that, because here we are facing this election this year, 120 seats plus the governor. And one of the things we keep hearing is why bother the election is rigged, mail-in voting, et cetera. So I want you to take us back. Take us back as the voters to what happened last August when the Trump campaign sued Murphy over the mail-in voting. We need to set the record straight and I want you to explain to people what happened, you were involved and how we got to where we are now. Okay, I'll start, you know, the best place to start is the beginning. So what happened was, as we all know, Governor Murphy loves to rule by executive order. Oh, yes. And Governor, yes. Governor Murphy uh, issued an executive order stating that last year, 2020, that the New Jersey elections were going to be held in a vote by mail fashion only. Well, we know that's unconstitutional pursuant to our United States Constitution. And our United States Constitution provides that all elections shall be handled by the state legislature. Right. So the, the Trump team, uh, obviously, um, I was Trump's co-chair for the state of New Jersey, along with Senator Joe Panaccio, but I'm also a practicing attorney and a county chairman as well of Cumberland. Right. Um, I was hired by Team Trump to sue the governor of New Jersey essentially just to uphold the United States Constitution and leave the election process to the legislature. Right. Now, about three days after the lawsuit was filed, a piece of legislation was rammed through the legislature to have a vote by mail election. So while we are not happy with the outcome of that, New Jersey actually got it correct in the way they handled it in a constitutional manner because it actually went through the legislature. Right. right. Contrast that with the state of Pennsylvania, where a lawsuit I don't believe was filed and it was a, an entirely vote by mail election only through an executive fiat from the Pennsylvania governor. Right. So, right. While New Jersey has been in, you know, under tyrannical rule since the beginning of the COVID-19 era, we did get this one thing correct, even though we're not happy with the outcome, because, uh, you know, we all know the hypocrisy that has been exhibited this entire time. You were able to go to any of the big box stores. You were able to wait in very long lines at the Motor Vehicle Commission, but you weren't allowed to vote in person, which is ridiculous. Right. But Pennsylvania never filed that same lawsuit and their entire election process, I still believe, was unconstitutional because their legislature never acted to state that their election process would be ent entirely vote by mail. Absolutely. Senator, agree. And I think, you know, that's what people forget is they say, why did we let this happen? Well, we did sue. Trump did sue. You were involved in that. The suit was was placed. But as soon as that was codified into law, which you're right, was the right way to do it, that became null and void. And now it became actually passed through the legislator and was signed by the governor. Pennsylvania never did that. They left themselves open to what should have been a, a challenge that you know resulted in something that it that hasn't yet. But so that's really what happened. So after it was passed, there was really nothing we could do at that point, right? That's absolutely correct. The only thing that we could do as Republicans is to make sure that all of us voted 
and unfortunately in a process that we weren't 100% confident in. But, you know, I can tell you, I wasn't thrilled with it. And, and the good thing is, is the governor has stated that this year's election, 2021, we will be allowed to vote in person. And we better be able to do that because I can tell you that a ton of my constituents and everybody that knows me knows that I'm always available uh, via social media, whether it's by email, whether it's by Facebook, whether it's by my Twitter account, I answer those messages. Um, many people contacted me. They, they were up in arms about an entirely vote by mail process. And the one thing that we have to be confident in is our election process. Right. And that's why I introduced the series of bills along with Senator Orojo, Senator Corrado, I believe Senator Bucco is involved as well. You know, a package of bills based on election integrity. And, and hopefully that should get bipartisan support because fair, open and honest elections should not be a partisan issue. It should not even be a bipartisan issue. It should be a nonpartisan issue. Our citizens need to have confidence in our election process. Absolutely. So what we have now is the promise of voting in person. We know we have extended early voting now as well, but are we still all getting ballots? Do we know that yet? We don't know whether we're all going to be getting ballots. And I can tell you where the most troublesome aspect of all of this came from. You know, one of my constituents reached out to me, who I know very well. He has three sons. His youngest son hasn't resided in his home or in this state for 10 years. And he received a ballot for all three of his sons who haven't lived with them at the very bare minimum of 10 years and all allegedly did the right thing, had their addresses forwarded, changed their address, don't have valid driver's licenses in the state of New Jersey. You know, they all live out of state. And unfortunately, they all received mail-in ballots. That's a problem. It's a huge problem. It's so shocking to me how the IT systems in the state do not talk. They simply do not talk to each other. And and yet, yet the we'll get to the vaccine passport discussion in a little bit. And somehow we're going to track all of this, but yet the DMV doesn't speak correctly to the Secretary of State. There's nothing coming from the funeral homes. I mean, we're involved, a lot of us, in voter roll cleanup as citizens, as citizens, Senator. And yet our state can't seem to get it right. We can't find out when someone died and get them off the voter rolls. How how do we expect to move forward in a state that's so broken technologically? Well, Elizabeth, you've pointed out the insanity, right? I mean, you know, we, we've experienced outdated technology specifically with, with what our citizens are going through with the unemployment process. Yeah. We have a COBOL-based system, which I've learned while a very old system could easily be updated and updated to handle this amount of chaos, you know, is the, is the best word I can come up with. The best, you know, the best way to handle all of this chaos was to update the COBOL system. And you have Governor Murphy saying that it's a waste of resources. Well, I don't believe that this is a waste of resources. And what we were told by the experts in a hearing that was, uh, you know, published online was that while it would cost about, you know, maybe $20 million, that's a drop in the ocean of the New Jersey state budget, which is, as we know, has ballooned up to $40 billion. Yeah. And, and that's a good transition to talk about. By the way, where's all that COVID money? And let's send let's spend 20 million to update the COBOL systems. But let's talk about the budget because sure. you were part of the lawsuit and we know the spending and the grabbing for money is out of control. And what's going to happen with that next, of course, is eventually taxes go up. It's unavoidable. You can't spend like crazy and not expect for that to happen. So talk about the lawsuit that you were involved in to stop the governor from grabbing this additional money. So originally we were told that the governor wanted to borrow $9.9 .9 billion. You know, I, I still believe that the New Jersey state constitution, where it, where it differs from the United States constitution, is that it requires a balanced budget. Right. Borrowing $9.9 .9 billion and my estimation violates that clause of the New Jersey budget being balanced. However, the, the Governor Murphy and his administration relied on the emergency clause contained in our New Jersey state constitution. So I was the lead attorney in suing the governor and you know, other counsel was involved, Mark Sheridan, who's extremely well-versed because he handled a prior lawsuit in suing the suing the governor um, about, I, I believe it was the, um, the bonding uh, mm -hmm. for the repairs to the state house. So 
we were told then that in that lawsuit, the holding of that lawsuit said that basically this could not be done. So we tried to rely both on the Constitution and legal precedent. And I don't want to get too in the weeds for your listeners, but so we sued. Um, unfortunately, the Supreme Court relied on both the emergency powers of the governor and the fact that we were in a state of emergency due to COVID-19. And they allowed the, the Murphy administration to borrow money as long as it was directly related to COVID-19. So miraculously, that $9.9 billion ask got drastically reduced to the $4.3 billion that were ultimately borrowed by the state of New Jersey. Now, the other thing that we warned about, both in the lawsuit and in the budget committee, where I'm a sitting member of the Senate budget committee, we warned that we should pump the brakes about this. You know, as conservatives, we said, this should be a time of tightening the belt, not, not engaging in what could be reckless spending. And we truly believed that the Murphy administration was relying on what really were doomsday prognostications or projections saying that we were going to be in such dire straits. And we, we should wait until we saw what revenues were actualized. So as of about two months ago, we knew for a fact, 100%, Elizabeth, we knew that the Murphy administration's estimations were off by $3.2 billion. Mm -hmm. And we learned about two weeks ago that there was an additional 700 million. So by simple math, 3.2 plus 700 million is 3.9 billion. So by my, by my simple math, that means that the maximum of $400 million may have needed to be borrowed, not $4.3 billion, because revenues far, far outperformed the doomsday projections of the Murphy administration. So here we are left in this state, and the way the governor borrowed this money, bonded this money, general obligation bonds, which are backed by the full faith and credit of the New Jersey citizenry, is, and this is what's really disturbing, they had a knee-jerk reaction in borrowing the money too soon, and they also made it non-callable. So what that means is, even with the money that has been actualized in revenues, we cannot pay those bonds back early. Oh my God. The taxpayers and the citizenry of the state of New Jersey are going to be strapped with this debt, which we have to pay an exorbitant amount of interest on for a generation to come. So you're saying we didn't really need the money. Not only that, but the debt service alone is going to last a very long time and it didn't have to. Is that what you're saying? That's exactly what I'm saying. You, you said it in much better layman's terms than I did. Yes. Wow. Wow. How disappointing is that? I mean, considering everything that's happened, that is just adding insult to injury. We cannot take any more burden as fiscal burden as as citizens of this state. People are fleeing, Senator. They can't retire here. They can't stay here with their children. How do we fix it? And, and that's been a theme that I've stated about the state of New Jersey. You know, so many of our retirees and our corporations, let's make no mistake about that, are fleeing our state. And one of the things that I used during my entire campaign in 2019, I, I held up my, my, you know, my smartphone. And I said, so many families see each other via a smartphone at, held at the dinner table because they, they simply can't come to Sunday dinners because they live in other states. And they're only seeing each other either on, unfortunately, what seems to be major holidays and funerals. Yeah. And that's really unfortunate. You know, I, I hear of so many retirees that have moved out of the state of New Jersey that I know personally that, you know, mm -hmm. either Zoom in or FaceTime, you know, their grandchildren for their birthdays. I mean, that's that's really sad. Um, it it's, it the economy it is destroying our families, destroying our businesses. Yeah. And we, yeah. we, we have a, a massive brain drain of our young people who get educated here at some of the finest academic institutions in the country, and they leave. The other thing, Elizabeth, that's really disturbing, you know, people want to look they're They've been living in fear and under tyranny for a year. Let's be honest. New Jersey borrowed more than any other state in the United States of America. That's not an accident. You know, other states, I think the next the next highest borrowing was done by the state of Illinois. And they were only, I believe, it's slightly over a billion. You know, so we borrowed over four times 
what the state of Illinois did, and they're in the most fiscal dire straits out of any nation, out of any state in the nation. Why are we why are we engaging in that type of reckless borrowing? And, it, and it's unfortunate that that news isn't out there or isn't really being covered by the mainstream media to say that the Murphy administration engaged in very risky fiscal behavior and our generations for years to come are going to be paying that debt off. So we need to be And can you explain how such a dictator who has really pushed people away from this state has made it so difficult for us, has really taken away our personal freedoms in the name of safety? How is he at a 60% approval rating? I mean, do you believe those polls? I mean, we all struggle with how is that possible? I'm, I'm waiting to find the person who is excited about the potential of him staying in office. Or am I just in my own echo chamber? It's shocking to me. Elizabeth, I don't believe you're in your own echo chamber whatsoever. I, I, I don't really put a lot of faith in mainstream polls. And, and, and I don't mean to make this about me, but I'll, I'll talk about my election in 2019. 11 days prior to my election, which I won by seven points, 6.9. I was allegedly down by the only poll that was done on my race. I was allegedly down 14 points. Now, you and I both know you can swing a few points in the last week and a half prior to an election. You're not making a 21 point swing. That's not happening. It's simply, in my opinion, statistically impossible, not improbable. It's so far at the end of the bell curve of probabilities that it's impossible. You know, I think I was a really good candidate, but I wasn't that good. I mean, there's no way I could create a 21 point swing. So I want to know who they're polling. You know, President Trump often used to say, did you get polled? Did you get polled? I want to know who's getting polled about Governor Murphy's performance. And, 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 and getting back to the budget, just to touch on this, we warned that this money was going to be borrowed so that there can be election year giveaways by the Murphy administration. And that's exactly what we're seeing happen. And, you know, nobody's going to be talking about the CBT. Nobody's going to be talking about the flight of corporations from the state of New Jersey. I mean, we are just not a very welcoming state, either for citizens to move here, citizens to stay here, corporations to open here, or corporations to stay here. We just aren't. And it's everything that's wrong with really the far left's way of thinking. You know, we, we constantly heard Governor Murphy say that New Jersey is going to be the California of the East Coast. I don't wanna be the California of the East Coast. I see what's happening in California. California is failing miserably. You know what I wanna be? I wanna be New Jersey. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We need to bring New Jersey back. And he has said that we, we're gonna be California. He wants to be California. He said, if you don't like it, move essentially, and you don't like the taxes, move. Uh, and by the way, we are now in the 13th month of his uh, executive powers, right? Emergency powers, I should say. Where is that going, Senator? When is that ending? Because it doesn't seem that there is a metric, that there is a goalpost, that there is any science, any data that any of us can understand that we will eventually reach or eventually accomplish so that we actually have our functioning government back again and we are no longer dictated by Murphy. So where are we going? You mentioned goalposts and that's something that, you know, a term that I've used frequently during what I believe to be a tyrannical period of ruling by Governor Murphy. And I've said that he's moved the goalposts so many times that we're no longer even playing the same sport. You know, Myself and Senator Doherty introduced legislation to put a limit on the governor's executive orders, not him being able to issue executive orders, but allowing the legislature to be that separate but equal branch of government that we're supposed to be. Right. That we get to review an executive order, an emergency executive order every 14 days, and we can either give it the stamp of approval on the legislature or allow it to die. What happened? We saw on a purely partisan basis, both times we made the motion to relieve, which is the proper way to handle things, it got tabled by um, Senator Weinberg one point and at Senator Scatari the other time. You know, we've been fighting each and every day, and that's something I, I, I mentioned to you offline that it upsets me that you'll you'll hear these Facebook comments and Twitter comments that 
we're doing nothing, we're just words. No, we're not. We're actually doing our job. And the governor has essentially made it certain that there's only two branches of government rather than that third separate but equal branch of government, the legislature. Look, I have to give kudos to state, you know, state senator, President uh, Steve Sweeney on this issue. He actually said it's time to end these executive orders. Yeah. Unfortunately, we know how far left some of the members of the legislate legislature are. They're not willing to give up Governor Murphy's executive powers. And it makes no sense to me because it actually prevents us from being able to do our job. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what, Senator, what shocks me is that those legislators have people in their district who are not happy with this situation on the left and the right. So I don't know why they're so tone deaf. We want our lives back enough already. And that, you know, that's true for anyone, even if you're afraid of COVID, not afraid of COVID. Everyone is dealing with some fear here, the fear of losing control of a lot of things. And when you're mandated for so long and told what to do for so long, this stops looking like the state we know. It stops looking like the life you're used to. So I want you, someone who particularly has fought alongside of us for personal freedoms since you've been a senator, I want you to talk about this looming potential vaccine passport. Now, it's a complicated issue because on surface, of course, it has challenges. But now we also have the idea that some states are outright banning it. The federal government is teasing about it, maybe pushing private companies to do it. And Murphy is right on the edge. We don't know. And of course, New York is trying to put it in place. So where do we stand with this vaccine passport? People are very concerned. Look, Governor Murphy readily admitted on national television that the Bill of Rights is above his pay grade. Mm -hmm. You know, when I took my oath of office, you place your left hand on the Bible, your right hand in the air, and you take an oath. You swear or affirm to uphold the United States and the New Jersey Constitution and all of the laws therein. I know the governor took the same oath that I did. So he took an oath to uphold the Bill of Rights. You know, you talked about our state not being the same, Elizabeth. Our country is not the same. No. You know, so many governors took advantage of the COVID-19 era. And I'm not saying this isn't a disease that we should not take seriously. I literally buried a friend of mine yesterday. I was a Paul Bearer for his funeral due to COVID-19. I take the disease seriously. However, I also take being an American seriously. I take the Bill of Rights very seriously. I take the constitution of both the United States and New Jersey very seriously. The beauty about America is that we are the land of the free and the home of the brave. Right. Our freedoms are being infringed upon, at every, it seems to be, at every single turn by this push from what I believe to be radical leftist ideals and, quite frankly, are what are un-American. So you asked me specifically about the vaccine passport, which I am vehemently against, and I've been all over saying I'm vehemently against it. If someone wants to get the vaccine, whether it be the Moderna or the Johnson & Johnson, be my guests. Go get it. That's the beauty about America. That's your freedom. I don't understand when people want to post about it online and show their vaccine certificate. I mean, you know, I, I want to start asking people, you know, men of a certain age when their next colonoscopy is. Like, it, it, makes no, it makes no sense to me that people are sharing their private medical information so readily online. It's perplexing to me. It really is. And why, how it's become some kind of a fad is disturbing to me, quite yes, frankly. Yes. That's a yeah. private yeah. medical decision that should be made on, on one's own accord. Um, you know, I'm a firm believer that the United States of America allows you to make decisions that are both good for you, that many people would agree are good for you, and also make decisions that aren't maybe not good for you. Our United States Supreme Court has held that there is a, a sect of Christianity that is allowed to deny their own children the right to a blood transfusion if it were life-saving. That's right. You know, do I agree with that personally? No, I don't, because I don't think that, you know, a parent should be able to deny their children a life saving measure. But you know what I do believe in? I believe in the holding by the United States Supreme Court that that's someone's religious belief and doing mandating that medical procedure, which is a simple one. Mandating that procedure is unconstitutional. Right. I, we have to be able to fight for things that we believe in and things that we don't believe in that are protected by
by our United States and New Jersey constitutions. So the vaccine passport to me is really going to be, be the first sign of a segregated society. And it really reeks to me of show me your papers. Mm-hmm. It really raises the hair on the back of my neck. Elizabeth, you don't know me. Um, you know, I'm the grandson of Holocaust survivors. My, my grandfather and grandmother met in a Nazi concentration camp. I did not have the pleasure of knowing them. I had the pleasure of knowing my great aunts and uncles who told me the, the horrors that they faced. Having people, places of business, being able to deny you the ability to either dine there, watch a movie, or ask you to show you, show them your papers is, is a place, I, a road I really don't want to travel down. And I don't care that it's allegedly for the greater good. This is a virus that has a 99.8, 99.9 survival rate. Do I want to see anyone get it? No. If someone is truly afraid of getting it, they should stay quarantined. But guess what? I have to look at other places that have done things drastically different than the state of New Jersey. Yeah. The state of New Jersey has had pretty much the most onerous restrictions in the United States of America. And our numbers, if we were a country, would be the worst in the world. That's right. They would be the worst in the world. So we're obviously not doing something correctly, despite all of the restrictions. And I look to countries like Sweden. I look to states like Florida. I look to states like Texas that are having better rates than the state of New Jersey. And guess what? They're open. Yeah. You know, I I think, you know, and somehow we're supposed to apply logic to these onerous restrictions. And we're also supposed to accept the fact that people like Governor Cuomo and Governor Murphy forced COVID-19 patients into long-term care facilities, nursing homes and veterans homes and think that's a good idea. I mean, that violates simple germ theory <laughs> that you're supposed to separate right. people right. who are infected from those who are not infected. Right. Those right. are the types of folks you're supposed to quarantine, not the healthy. This is the first time in the history of the world that I'm aware of that we've quarantined healthy people. Yeah. yeah. That is a very concept that we would do that, and I totally agree on all of that. And by the way, I didn't know that about your family. And so I think it's really interesting that you have that in your background. And people forget very quickly what happened not that long ago. It's a slippery slope. And I'm curious as a lawyer, how do you see this legally, an ability to tell someone that they have to put something in their bloodstream for the greater good, which by the way, that was used back then, that argument, the greater good, to produce the you know horrific things that came out of the sure. early 40s. So as a lawyer, how do you see this rolling out if it does? Because not only is, are there obvious, I think, HIPAA issues, legal issues, constitutional issues, but we've also got other states saying no way, Florida saying no way. How do we do interstate travel? How does any of this play out? And I'm curious as a lawyer, what your opinion is on the potential of this? Well. Look, I mean, my understanding of, of the federal legislation and other attorneys have uh, I've had the benefit of other attorneys emailing me their opinions and things of that nature because they know I'm I'm on the front lines and I've and I've read those emails thoroughly and the attachments that they've sent. My understanding of federal law is that it is illegal to mandate someone take a vaccine that is still in the emergency or experimental stage. So legally, I have a real problem with that. So the Rutgers mandate, I think, flies in the face of well-settled law. Um, you know, it, it's amazing to me how, how quickly people are so willing to give up their rights in the name of the greater good. And look, like I said, if the vaccine works so well, why do I need to get it to protect you? That's right. I, I, I'm really perplexed by that logic. Yeah. You know, um, look, knock on wood, I haven't gotten COVID during this entire time. I've taken the precautions. I've also taken exercise. And as you see, drinking water seriously and taking my supplements seriously, like I do throughout my life. I mean, I think people need to lead healthy lifestyles. And look, if, if someone is at risk and has all of those comorbidities, they should avoid interacting with crowds. They should do everything that they possibly can. But we've unfortunately 
shut down an entire economy. We know we already know the early effects of all of this, and that is over a third of our New Jersey small businesses will never open their doors again. Never. That is unacceptable. That is an unacceptable collateral consequence of Governor Murphy's tyrannical ways. And what's what's disturbing about this is that you constantly hear the rhetoric come out of Governor Murphy's mouth that we're all in this together. And, And I think you can hear that I'm getting passionate about this because it really disturbs me. Because guess who answers the phone all the time? My staff, people like Brittany O'Neill, people like Arvine, people like Cynthia in my office. And eventually they get to me of these people who are hurting, these businesses who are hurting and saying, how come Home Depot is allowed to be open? I counted the cars in their parking lot. And yet I'm not allowed to have more than 25 percent dining in my restaurant. I mean, that was a disturbing time. And, you know, we constantly heard from Governor Murphy that, to follow the science and that the data would drive the dates. Well, how are we following the science now? Every other state is more open than the state of New Jersey. How are we following the science? How, are, how is the data driving the dates when we're not even being provided the damn data? I mean, it's really frustrating, you know, every single turn because these are just words to Governor Murphy. But guess what? The real people out there and businesses that are suffering immeasurably, people losing their life savings, their blood, sweat and tears. I mean, and and talk about the data driving the dates. I'll give you data because I have it from my legislative district. In July of last year, at at the alleged height of COVID-19 in the state of New Jersey, my entire legislative district accounted for less than 2% of all COVID-19 cases in the state. Yet all of those beautiful shore towns in Cape May were under some of the most onerous restrictions in the United States of America. I can tell you this much, my legislative district cannot survive another summer of those restrictions. Period, stop, Phil Murphy. Yep, absolutely, Senator. And listen, I'm glad that you get so worked up. I appreciate that about you and everyone else does as well. We know you're fighting for us. Listen, our businesses are hurting, our children are hurting at all ages. We could talk a half an hour about that on its own. Families are hurting, our our economy is hurting. Everybody is feeling this and it's time for it to end. And unfortunately, I, I know you have something else to go to and we've already passed our time, but I have to tell you, Senator, it's people like you that give us hope. And I say that with the most sincerity because we do need to get upset. This shouldn't be just something that we live with and we work with. No, it's not acceptable anymore. And I wanna thank you on behalf of all of the citizens of New Jersey that you're fighting for our freedoms and to get our lives back. And Senator, you know, this is is kind of our last chance to save New Jersey from, I don't know, never looking the same again. I think it's pretty critical, don't you? I I do think it's critical. And you know, I I, I hearken back to Governor Kane's uh, slogan, if you re- I'm sure you remember it. Yeah. New Jersey and you perfect together. Well, we need to make New Jersey and you perfect together again. And there's and there's really one way to do it. We have a gubernatorial election this year. All 80 seats in the assembly are up. All 40 seats in the Senate are up. Yeah. We need to make sure every single Republican votes in this election. And whoever comes out of the, of the primaries, people can't be heard about it. They cannot allow the perfect to get in the way of the good, as Ronald Reagan once said. We need to get Republicans out, off of their butts, and to the polls to vote in person and make sure we put New Jersey back on track and make New Jersey and you perfect together again. Perfect. Not only that, the independents want their lives back, and the soft Democrats that aren't really happy to come over to our side, take another look, because we've got some great ideas and you're one of our bright stars. Senator, thank you so much. You are so appreciated. We will have you back. You exemplify what Jersey First is all about, which is about fighting for really common sense legislation and laws that policies that protect our families and protect our businesses and puts Jersey first. So thank you, Senator. We appreciate your time so much. Thank you so much. And I really look forward to being back, Elizabeth. Thank you. And hopefully next time we can do an in-person interview. That sounds so good to me. We will do that, Senator. Uh, Thank you so much again. And everybody will see you next week.